WNYC-TV presents Barbara Lee Diamondstein and... Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein. It's not often that people agree on matters of taste, especially in the world of art. But there is at least one incontrovertible fact, and that is that Louise Nevelson is the doyen of American sculptors. It is a very special pleasure to welcome you, Louise. Thank you. Most of us know Louise Nevelson's work as contemplative, black, white, mysterious assemblages. Many of you know her as a philosopher, as a glamour lady, as I guess an executor of more extraordinary commissions than almost any other sculptor in this century. I'm thinking of the most recent Louise. Not only are you one of the busiest artists in the world, but your work pours forth with uninterrupted regularity. In the most recent period, you finished three monumental and I guess dreamlike assignments for any creative person. And I'm thinking specifically of, to begin with, your complex design of all the sculpture, the architectural ornament, and even the vestments for St. Peter's Church. Then I'm thinking of Louise Nevelson Plaza, a park bounded by, and quite appropriately, by Maiden Lane and Liberty, where there are seven monumental metal sculptures. And then I'm thinking of a wall 17 feet by 35 feet that has recently been installed at the World Trade Center. I mean, there are three remarkable commissions. Can you tell us something about each of them? Actually, many of them took place, at least two of them took place, during the course of almost a press blackout in New York City, during the course of the newspaper strike. Perhaps you could tell us in your own words about the genesis and the origin of Louise Nevelson Plaza. Why don't we start with that? Where is it? What is it? Why do you call the works flags? How did you arrive at their placement, their design? Well, it was uh, nearly a year and a half ago that I was approached to do a park in New York City where people can enjoy it. No fences, as you notice. And that, uh, you know, in New York, seven months a year you can sit down outdoor and enjoy yourself. So this uh, triangle down Maiden Lane and facing the Federal Reserve Bank was uh, offered to me. I went down, studied it, realized that it was facing the Hudson River. It was a lovely place and the buildings are so compact they are really like mountains surrounding it. Consequently, it, that was the framework, and uh, that appealed to me because every building has thousands of people working there. I don't expect the executives to come and sit around the park, but I do ex expect the people that work there that have their lunch time and uh, thereafter to come and enjoy the park. Plus, if you realize that from Chinatown to that place, it's been built up like a new city. And from the west side to that place, from the Battery Park, they are building up. And as you know, the tribe, what is it, Tribeca, has uh, made Wall Street section a 24-hour a day living place, whereas uh, previous to this, night was dead down there. So it's a whole living center where people can enjoy it. They can come from both sides and really have fun. Because I have a feeling that there will be music played there lunchtime eventually, there will be dance, there will be poetry. It will be used by the people. Now, 
one other thing that is wonderful, and well, when you asked me about the flags, well, you see the buildings are so tall, and the buildings are triangular, you know, as they go up. Consequently, uh, th these flags were designed so that they would not be on the ground, but they looked as if they were flying, you see. And uh, really... You uh, referred to yourself as a primitive artist when you created them. What did you mean by that? Well, what I meant was that today you can make a small either maquette or a drawing things and send it to the foundry and uh, that can be made up at, at all any dimension. But I feel, as I said to you, that uh, well, I still go to the foundry and work with the men and create while I'm there. I've done it now since the foundry is in existence and uh, the same people so I work with. So you are with. there during the fabrication of your piece. Does the piece evolve while you're there? Yes. Rather than just doing a drawing or a maquette and sending it off and waiting for the finished work, which is a respectable way to do it too, yes. you've chosen another way. Yes, well I've chosen to go there with the men and do it piece by piece. Also, technology comes into it, science comes into it. Now, suppose I want a piece uh, that is a ton for one piece. I will say to the boys, uh, these are the boys at the foundry. At the foundry. I'll say, uh, I want this piece. Now, they have the mechanics that they pick that up as if it was a piece of paper and lay it down as I wish. So well, does your work evolve while you're there? Yes, yes. Do you ever change it while it is being created? Sometimes. Not too often at this point in my life, but there are times that as they evolve, you begin to see there may be a piece. I try to avoid it, but if it is not what I want, then we do take it off. You see, my dear, that we call that spot welding. Spot welding. Now, it isn't that much of a problem. It is a problem, but not that much to take it down in that first stage. And I do think for myself that for what, for my time and what I understand, I prefer to do it that way. There's something like a spiritual labor pain, if you wish, but it's very satisfying to me. You mentioned there were thousands of workers in those office buildings. Obviously mm -hmm. those thousands of workers are all at different levels as well. Mm -hmm. Did you take that into consideration while you were designing the Oh park? yes, that's why I call them flags because they are, uh, well, I don't quite remember the different um, feet from the sidewalk or from the mm -hmm. plaza itself. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, for that very reason, uh, so that they can float in, when you look out of different windows, you can see them. And did you determine that from going to any of those buildings? I determined that by going to some of the buildings, yes. Also, what I think was kind of wonderful is when I was doing them in the foundry, uh, we had land enough and we measured it off and everything was done and placed just as if we were doing it downtown permanently. But what a remarkable story, particularly in the city, that is obviously still suffering fiscally. Where did we get the money, and I must introduce that note, to create seven monumental metal forms, tons and tons of metal, foundry, park? Where did all that money come from? Well, uh, I do have a, I can call it a patron if you wish, who uh, has been very generous with me, plus the fact that uh, he's already called me, I have never met him, and what is my new project? So you have never met this patron, an no. anonymous donor? That's right, that's right. It's uh -huh. quite remarkable. Well, it is remarkable because I think that, um, from what I understand, that he is very unique. Have you ever had a similar experience? Never. 
Has How many any experiences like that can you have in a lifetime? Once is more than <laughs> one would expect. Has yeah. he in any way dictated content or location? Not at all. No, I've had free reign. You see, dear, that's a very important point, at least to me. I never took commissions of any kind until I was about 70. And that means by that time, when I was ready to take commissions, there has never been an architect, never a person that has uh, asked me to do it. There's never been any question, but never. And of course, I avoided that until I was ready to know that I could accept them without any interference. Louise, by now I guess it's rather widely known that you were born in Russia and raised in Maine. But you've been a resident of New York City, and I think it's time, you always talk about claiming your own life, that we must claim you. You've been a resident of New York City for, I guess, almost 60 years now. Yes. You've always said that there is something about this environment that nourishes your creativity and that influences your work. What is it about New York, and does it still make you sing? Well, the very question makes me sing. <laughs> yes, uh, some people, you know, can um, measure time and space. But New York, for me, is unlimited, just totally unlimited. And no matter where I go, uh, I just find that I want to come back to New York because some of us could not fulfill ourselves elsewhere. Some people need a wide stage. Some people don't. I know uh, I could name many uh, very gifted artists and also gifted in every other walk of life that need more quietness, more awareness. I thrive on the excitement of New York, the uh, well, look, if you're a great singer, you want to sing at the Metropolitan Opera. If you're a great artist, you want to show in New York City. If you're a great dancer, you want to show in New York City. And if you think, take a bus and go up Fifth Avenue, Park Avenue, and then around the city, and when you look into some of the homes, and when you think of all the great works of art in these homes, we don't think like that, but if you take a minute and think about it, and the great furniture in these places, and all the things that do enter into these, this city is, uh, offers anything and everything. There's an excitement and the energy, the accumulated energy of all sorts in this city and, and also the people, because almost every human being, it's the exception that doesn't want to come and live in New York. Let's take a moment and think about your environment, the personal environment. How is it? How do you live? <laughs> You've been there. You should know. <laughs> But I'd like them to know. I think okay. it's that remarkable and that special. All right. Well, uh, the, my... What's the environment that you prefer personally to be surrounded by? Well, I'm pretty contented where I am uh, because, well, I've been there in that same place for 21 years now, and the first house was a private sanitarium. It's five stories. And it's built, actually, uh, it was a copy of uh, the Grand Canal, one of those palazzios. There were 17 rooms there. And then the house next to it is an older house. And I broke through. Then the garage is newer, and I broke through that. So I have a combine there of quite a bit of space. But that's not all the space, <laughs> because I also, you see, work in a foundry. I also work in another uh, carpentry shop. I have my own, but I also, for the bigger pieces, do work there. Then I go to do my etchings at another place, then I go to another place to do my uh, graphics. So you see, what's around me is pretty substantial, but not altogether. For the bigger things, we have other places. In a way, and I don't want it to sound uh, remote. It is austere and it is tranquil. But in a way, it is almost a museum of your own work. 
because you are surrounded by works of every period. Well, you, you must remember that I don't consider it a home. Now, if, for example, I consider where I live is a place that's on wheels. If I choose, for instance, to paint in one place, I can easily uh, take things out so that the whole area is actually studio. Now, don't forget that I have 24 chairs and they stack, so they don't take very much space. You can put them in a closet. Then I don't really have furniture. Consequently, all that area and all that space can be used anytime I wish for any of the projects. Again, we're talking about environment. Actually, there are many of us that see you as the originator and the chief exponent of environmental art. When and how did that term originate? Well, that was long ago. I'm trying to think how long ago, but very long ago. I um, actually with Grand Central Modern, Moderns when they were on Madison Avenue and they said I could put the show on. Now that was the first time that they said that I could use the space as I wish. Well, once I got my things in there and there was so much of it and so much energy in it and all that I uh, decided to reconstruct the whole place. So I closed off certain windows, threw out their desks and furniture, seating like chairs or benches that usually, everything went out. And I did create a whole environment, and so much so that Life Magazine, of course, uh, did a whole, uh, well, a whole issue, not an issue. Picture spread. Mm -hmm. A what, dear? A spread. Yes. On it. Mm -hmm. You've, do you consider yourself the originator of that term? I accept art? that, certainly. Mm -hmm. I know that probably as time went on, uh, that word was used probably when happenings were happening in a different way a little bit. But nevertheless, I consider, if you look back in my, uh, what do you call it, archives, in the archives, you will find that uh, it began there. While we're looking back, we should be looking forward as well mm -hmm. to this remarkable book of conversations that Louise Nevelson has held with Diana McCowan. The title of the book is Dawns and Dusks, and some of the things that we're talking about briefly now, in great and anecdotal, sometimes touching, sometimes amusing length, is described in Dawns and Dusks. It's one of my favorite books, and I hope it'll be yours. Um, you said from the very beginning of your life that one of the most important things in your life was to claim it totally. Sometimes I've heard you use the phrase, a blueprint for life. Sometimes I've wondered if you likened your work in a sense to that of an architect. That sometimes your work reminds me of almost of scale models for a small city. Is there a grand design? Was there from the very beginning? Well, now you're talking about architecture, more or less. I'm really also talking about philosophy yes, more than well that, yeah, that's better. specifically. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, there was. Somehow or another, I refer back to genes because I always claim that there's some of us come ready-made. You know, really, if you look into many lives that uh, have known they were, say, musical or that they were visual or what they were. And uh, you see, I don't think I allow too much for chance or different things because I knew I, what I was going to do from childhood and I've never varied. I never, sometimes I think that I must have been stupid because I was like a horse with blinders. I only knew one way to go. And uh, never dawned on me somehow to do anything else. And of course, it's been difficult. And also, uh, I was going to say, 
I felt for many years that I was living in a kind of spiritual labor pain deal. And uh, in retrospect, of course, I feel that th that was the only way to do it for me. How did you ever happen upon wood as a medium for your work? Yes. Well, that was the Second World War. And what happened was uh, you couldn't buy uh, bronze and all the expensive materials. What's more, because of the war, and what's more, who could afford it if you could mm -hmm. buy some? And then uh, my kind of mind likes instantaneous likes to relate immediately with what it's doing. And I think that uh, it, for example, I think the work really kind of forced itself on me. I had made the decision then. I said, now look, I can't afford this. There is a ward. You can't get material. What do you want to do? Uh, maybe it's futile to work at all. There may be uh, danger in wherever you are. And I thought, well, I think the most important thing to living is to do it, no matter if a plane comes and destroys it or whatever, but you must go on working. And so, uh, there are things happened to me. I saw, for instance, in my studio outside, I, I've described it in the book, by the way. There was a box. It must have contained once a rolled up rug because it was very narrow. It was about six or eight in six inches, I think, uh, wide. It must have been eight feet long. And it was about, well, so six feet tall. So it must have been a rug. And I looked at it and I thought, well, this is gorgeous. Well, I took it before I could think too much. I brought it in the studio and began working with it. Then I began working. So it was almost a natural, like it imposed itself on me and I imposed myself on that. So it was, it was a natural and then I began singing with it. You know, it began was to there, swing, swing like the flags. Was there anything, in, let, let's put another myth to rest. Yeah. Is there anything in your background that really made it obvious that you would go to wood as a medium? Not consciously, of course. You know, everyone knows that my father was in lumber and builder and, and actually he was very capable. But I didn't think so at the time. Now consciously, no. As a matter of fact, if I was conscious, I probably wouldn't have done it. <laughs> Louise, the critics have always admired your work, but for quite some time, a very, very long time. It seemed that the public did not quite think that your found object wood sculptures were either aesthetically or monetarily valuable. Now, of course, your work is very widely applauded. How did you manage to sustain yourself during all that period? Well, I wouldn't say it was a joy, <laughs> but uh, I thought it was necessary. I just thought it was necessary. I learned how to throw things together. I think that's how I got to be the Leia lady <laughs> on clothes. I learned how to throw things together. I learned how, uh, to begin with, I seem to have had energy for probably many people, not one. I used to exhaust myself. I still do. Consequently, I learned that. I learned order. Now, in my house, it's supposed to have been 17 uh, rooms. The other house is four floors and a studio. Well, how do I keep order without too much help? Well, I've learned all these things. In order to arrive to the place I wanted, I had to train myself, probably like a prize fighter. You said that most artists, there's a psychic pain for creation and that most artists create out of despair. Mm -hmm. It appears to me that these are the best years of your life and also the most productive in many ways. Has this success affected your work? Well, let me say this. Uh, during the years, I had to dig and I dug into almost every ism and every philosophy that I could touch. And But unfortunately, I have to admit that 
they all left me a little wanting. I could not encompass or accept totally any of it. So I went on searching, 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 and uh, that went for foods too, for foods and for religion and for and humanities, all these things. But I must say that I didn't quite, I wasn't quite willing to accept totally. Nevertheless, there is a great deal that left with me that sustained me. Now, besides that, I, uh, when you say public and things, my whole life is that my work has revealed to me what I want. It, it, it's the work and I, it's not the public and I. The public is a reflection of the other. So I don't think that I would have permitted the public to take over what I had to do. I could go on that, but it would be too well, revealing. In reason. other words, I wouldn't give the public the right to superimpose on what I wanted. What my work did for me is I didn't do work for the public. I didn't make sculpture or painting. I was searching like some man or some being, they go in gold mines and they go and they search and they dig or they go to silver or they go to diamond mine. They dig to find the diamonds, to find the gold. Well, I was digging to find what life was about. Still digging a little. You said recently that some recent work gladdened you especially. You said it was essences. Is that what you have in mind? Yes. I did say that the la when I got, uh, I wanted a little, little change from three dimensions. And I went again to uh, to uh, etchings? etchings, but what I was going to say is I had done etchings before. I had been doing them since the 1940s with Hater way back. But I went back to etchings and I used lace once before way back too, so there was nothing new. But somehow when I got there, all I did was place things. Now, it's something you can't talk about. It's a feeling, it's a measurement, it's a timing, it's a love affair, and it's like if you have a book and you know if you have two pages, how do you know that you've skipped a page? It's somehow, it isn't even seen, and yet we know there's another instinct, there's another awareness, there's another knowing. And anyway, so they came like well, I, anyway, they pleased me and gladdened me, and I called them essences. Thank you, Louise Nevelson. It's pleasing and gladdening for you to come, and I hope you'll come and do your annual visit next year again. Louise Nevelson, a distinguished artist, a remarkable woman. I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Thank you, audience, for being with us, too.